How you doing, Coach? Good morning. How's everything in Knoxville? Everything's good. You're familiar with Knoxville, right? I am. I was a graduate assistant coach for Coach Majors back in uh, 1983 there at the University of Tennessee and just uh, loved Knoxville and loved the University of Tennessee. We'll talk about that experience and some of the some of the, the recollections of your time here. Surely. It's a, uh, you know, I think that, that year was uh, Coach Majors just come off a, a, a relatively tough year the year before. Uh, we ended up that year going to – the old Florida Citrus Bowl uh, played a quarterback down there by the name of Boomer Esiason, uh when he was at Maryland. Had a couple tough losses during that season. One to kind of a nationally ranked Pitt team and uh, an Ole Miss team that was probably uh, was not probably as good. But uh, that was Reggie White's last year there at the University of Tennessee, and uh, got some very very fond memories of my time period there. And I'll tell you, I learned a tremendous amount from. From Coach Majors and from Philip Fulmer and some of the other guys that are, you know that are uh, long-standing icons there at the University of Tennessee. Do you ever get a chance to interact with with either of them? I do, uh, actually, quite frequently. Um, I'm fortunate. I'm on the board of trustees of the American Football Coaches Association. Uh, both those gentlemen are very, very involved in that still to this day, and uh, uh, past presidents of the association. And so yeah, I do have. Uh, some opportunities both uh, generally in January and then again in May to spend some time with them. We're visiting with Todd Barry. He's a head football coach at ULM, and we'll, we'll hit on the schedule. Certainly very, very difficult, very challenging. Coach, what about last year? Give me some, some thoughts on, on last year, 4-8 and eight season, and, uh, and the things that, that in moving into this year you want to get better at. Yeah, we, you know, we came in here two years ago, uh, played with the freshman team our first year, and and probably surprised a few people, played a little better, uh, stayed healthy, all those other kinds of things. Uh, last year was a disappointment for us. Uh, I, I think that um, we had some high expectations as a team. I think the fan base had some high expectations of us also because of the number of returning starters that we had. And uh, unfortunately for us, we went through a, just a rash of injuries, and especially at some positions that we really couldn't afford. And, and we needed to, you know, uh, continue to build our depth from a recruiting standpoint and Quite frankly, it was one of those seasons to where you, uh, you go in hoping that you're going to stay healthy, and the reality of it is that we didn't, and it, it cost us. We lost a lot of close games last year, and uh, but the, the probably the good out of all that is the fact that I think our uh, through some adversity like that, you you, know, you either come together as a team or you break apart, and I think it brought this team closer together, and even though we only have listed 15 returning starters the reality of it is because of all the injuries we have 29 returning starters and um you know that's significant for us here in terms of the experience but we do have a difficult schedule uh, as we always will here and uh but we're, we're anxious for that opportunity and those challenges that are you know upcoming yeah i'm glad you mentioned the schedule there as i look at it i can see you guys really ease into the season there with a, a game against arkansas auburn and baylor <laughs> That's correct. Yeah, uh, you know, last year it was uh, you know Florida State, TCU, and Iowa, and the year before that it was Arkansas, Auburn, and LSU. And uh, you know, it's important for us those games are uh, to try to gain more experience with our football team in terms of playing really, really good opponents. And one of the things about this team, because we've been playing with the same team here for really the last two years, is the fact that I don't think our players worry too much about the helmets anymore. And I think that's a big part of becoming more competitive not just within our conference but within the, within those games themselves because our guys are used to going into those venues and they're used to seeing those those helmets that are you know traditionally nationally ranked teams and and so you know again we're excited about the opportunities uh we'll uh we'll go out and we'll play hard and that's one thing i know about this team is we'll go out and play hard and and, and i like this team a lot I, I really do this this team's got some some moxie to it it's got some maturity and and uh, you know, traditionally we can run really well and, and can show up uh, against some of those other teams that are out there and, and at least be able to run with them. Yes, we came on air today and we were talking about the, the Monroe program and one of the lasting memories I have was that upset of Alabama in Nick Saban's first year. But you seem to like the the experience of this team. Is there a possibility? I'm not trying to put you on the spot predicting a win, <laughs> but, but there is a possibility that you could get another benchmark win for this program. Well, you know, obviously that's uh, that's the goal every year, and then will continue to be for every everybody across the country. I mean, you you, you go out to try to win every game, and and uh, certainly for us, uh, we recognize that those are huge, huge challenges for us. Uh, we're still not as experienced as uh, again as what we need to be in terms of we're playing with. We have five senior starters on this team, 
and uh, you know, it's the next year where all of a sudden we're going to get to where we'd like to be, which is mostly senior starters backed up by juniors. And it's uh, you know, there's a process that's uh, that you have to kind of go through. But I do. Th- this team has shown that they can be competitive with some people. Uh, last year, we were we were a really good football team when we were healthy, and I think our team can look back on those past experiences, both against some of these top 25 you know teams, along with some of the experiences of the, the uh, their uh, the amount of time that they've actually played and some of the maturity within the group, and, and feel you know feel good about their abilities to be able to go out and compete. We're visiting with ULM Warhawks head football coach Todd Barry, former grad assistant at Tennessee under Johnny Majors, running the program at ULM here on our sports page, summer of football previewing teams in 2012. We talked about the schedule a little bit, and I looked through, and I had to do this. I had to triple check this when I was going through everyone's schedule in college football. Your team is the only team in the country with a bye week the first week of the year and the last week of the season with every week without a buy in between. Uh, is that just from uh, other teams' requested you have to slide some things out? How, how did how did that end up happening? Well, certainly our conference, uh, you know, they, they put in our conference schedule, so you don't have any real control over that. And, and you know, quite honestly, uh, uh, you know, we need the money uh, to yeah. accelerate this program. And part of getting the money games, uh, such as Arkansas and Auburn, is the fact that they're going to pay you a lot of money. They're going to tell you when to play. <laughs> and so you don't really have a lot of options along those lines. And and it just so happened, uh, this is the second time this has happened to us. The, uh, it happened to me our first year also where we had, didn't have a bye week and had this thing kind of set up. Um, you know, ideally, you'd probably like to have a bye week at some point in time during the season, but I've seen bye weeks help you and I've seen bye weeks hurt you. And uh, so we we love the fact that we have 12 games on our schedule and, and we're going to go out and play them and uh, we're not going to complain about anything. It doesn't do any good to do that. Just We're just going to have to we're, – we're certainly a deeper team right now and that certainly helps in terms of our abilities to be able to go throughout the season and be able to survive uh, a season without a bye week in it. Todd, as you see the landscape of college football changing – these last few months and you look ahead to the future and you see these super conferences forming and, and them increasing the amount of conference games that they have to play. How do you foresee that affecting a program like Louisiana Monroe, as far as it's non non conference scheduling and, and the amount of opportunities you get a chance to play like in Arkansas or in Auburn and Baylor? Well, I, I, you know, I think it's a, it's a good point. I think we're, we're certainly, uh, we've gone through some cycles in the past and college sports. I've, you know, been in this thing for 30 years and I was a head coach at Illinois State and a head coach at Army and and in the process of all this time frames and, and different times when I've been head coaches you know been a head coach the uh there's the landscape of college football has certainly changed but I don't know that we've gone through as dramatic a time period as what we're going through right now and uh with uh, my opportunities to be on the board of trustees of the coaches association a lot of these things uh, you know, I've heard of, you know, I hear before it ever happens uh, because we kind of look at those things that are kind of coming down the road. I, I think there's going to be some interesting time periods for college football and some decisions that are going to have to be made in terms of uh, where all this had. Certainly, uh, you know, it's been important for us over the last two years, which we've tried to do to try to posture ourselves for some of this realignment. I, I think that um, we haven't been sitting on the sidelines. It's part of the reason why we've taken some of the money games is to be able to accelerate our facility development and all those type of things in preparation for all this. I, you know, I think that, that with the recent playoff move, uh, the non-AQ status being AQ for everyone, I think that's probably going to look around, as, as you look around college football, it's going to change some people's minds about whether they did the right thing in terms of aligning with a certain conference. And while I thought initially this thing was kind of over with in terms of everybody kind of moving and, shaking i think that that uh we might still see some more movement and that and certainly that's going to create a little bit more chaos in college football just because of a uh, cost of travel and all those other kinds of things that impact um this and then certainly the playoff is going to uh significantly increase the amount of money to somebody um hopefully it's going to go to to like it does in basketball to a good percentage of college football because certainly i think the fcs levels the old division one double a are really really hurting right now in terms of attendance because there's a good game on college you know a good college football game on television you know basically all day long on Saturdays and and we need to make sure that all of college football benefits from from these kind of opportunities rather than just a unique few 
and uh, certainly the unique few are going to get their their part of it. But some of this needs to be uh, shared to all of college football so that we keep the game alive at at all universities, and so that everybody can benefit and every student body can benefit to some degree, like they do, like they haven't done in basketball over these years. So. It's going to be an interesting time period. There's no question. Do you think we'll get through that 12-year contract for the four-team playoff, or will will it expand before they even get to through that 12 years? I was part of the 1AA playoffs as a head coach, and uh, I've always been a playoff proponent because of my experiences in the playoff and what it did for, I think, uh, that level of football along with uh, with our team and, and our, you know, our university. I was at Illinois State at the time. And uh, – and so consequently, I think that, you know, this, uh, I think as we look down the road that there's a possibility for some expansion. I think that it needs to be uh, measured uh, in terms of how far it goes, how fast. But I think that, I think it's probably wise on our part with all the different things that are going on right now from a financial standpoint around the country and uh, in terms of state appropriations and so on, that we have to look at uh, how do we financially support not just you know, better football, but also you start looking at most programs, including the University of Tennessee, and and the football program basically supports uh, not just all the other athletic programs that are on campus, but even some other things within the academic environment there. And and, uh, so I think it's important we continue to look at some of those things in terms of the money-making possibilities uh, for the universities uh, to assist everybody at the universities and, and continue to you know, grow the opportunities for uh, for all those the student athletes and the students on campus. Joined by ULM head coach Todd Barry here on the New Sentinel Sports page, Vince Ferrar and Jesse Smithy. Coach, if you could give us some names of some key guys for for your team on both sides of the ball for our listeners when they're flipping around and catching some college football this year. Well, we've got we've got a quarterback that was uh, a freshman All American and. Uh, Two years ago, uh, last year he broke his sternum. His name's Colton Browning, and I, I think he's a special player. Uh, we've got a tight end in the name of Kevon Milton who missed most of the season last year. Who's, according to most of the NFL draft guys, you know he's going to be a draftable guy this next year because he's six four and a half and he's two ninety and he runs well and he catches the ball well and he missed a good portion this season last year with an injury. Uh, we have a returning All Conference receiver in Brent Leonard, who has also got some NFL interest. Uh, we have a linebacker here who's been a four-year starter in Cameron Blakes, um, who in our defensive structure, we finished in the top 25 in the country last year on defense, and uh, Cameron's a big part of that, and he's another guy that I think is getting some pretty extensive NFL looks. Um, and then we have a couple running backs in Jairus Edwards and Centarius Donald, who I think uh, could make... Um, you know, some significant noise as the season progresses this year with both of them being injured again last year. They were our two top backs, and they were both injured last year. Uh, it, you know, it's going to be nice to have both those guys back. Um, we've got a couple transfer guys to, uh, from one awesome Moss from the University of Arkansas. We'll see how he continues to do. Jaron Johnson from the University of Missouri that I think are both really fine players, but they haven't played for us yet, so we'll see how they do uh, during preseason camp and so on. Coach, last thing, just wondering what the, I guess, the ripple effect of Gus Malzahn taking over at Arkansas State uh, in y'all's conference has been. Is that in, is that going to help the conference as far as pushing guys to recruit better? Well, I, I think it's certainly going to drive the coaches' salaries up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, Gus is a really, really good football coach. And I've known Gus for quite some time, even whenever he was the high school coach at Springdale High School. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and Gus has done a fine job. He's certainly a, a creative, innovative mind. I think in college football, I think that one of the things that I found here early on, and I think most coaches do, this is this league is is really blessed to have tremendous parity, a lot of really really good football coaches in it, and I, I think that that first year everybody wants to go out and get a lot of early commitments, and the reality of it is there's still a lot of guys that are sitting on the sideline that are waiting for a University of Tennessee offer. Uh, we kind of found here that the best thing to do was kind of sit back and wait. We had a bunch of early commitments my first year because that's traditionally what you do but in in uh in this part of the country where there's a lot of athletes and there's a lot of good football players uh we kind of found that maybe it's better to kind of sit on the side a little bit and kind of wait a few things out and uh that goes against the norm of what most what goes on in college football most of the time but most of the guys that have been in this league now you'll see that most everyone else doesn't have a lot of early commitments right now because they kind of did the same thing that we did that first year and did that and then turned around and looked Said, hey, gosh, well, we'd 
we don't have a scholarship for this guy, and this guy's pretty good. I, I got to squeeze in one last thing. Do you know Derek Dooley or any of the members of the, the Tennessee staff very well? I don't, uh, you know, which is pretty odd uh, because I've been in this thing for 30 years and mm-hmm. they've coached all over the country. And I can't say that I really know any. I've met several of them, but in terms of actually really knowing them, uh, you know, I've been at 13 different institutions all around the country. And generally in that process, you end up coaching with somebody. Uh, but that, that's unique and that I don't know anybody there at the University of Tennessee currently. 